We had a fantastic beginning last night, and now we're ready to continue our exploration. So let me just uh, redefine the purpose of this colloquium. What we're trying to do is to explore all those movements in the 20th century uh, that did not follow the traditional pattern, that went beyond tradition to create new and sometimes radical alternatives uh, to rabbinic and traditional Judaism. Uh, and we're going to be exploring in order uh, the reform movement, which certainly in its inception was a, a radical movement, the Reconstructionist movement, the Renewal Movement, the Yiddishist Nationalist Movement, the Zionist Movement, and also the alternatives uh, that arose for a feminist Judaism and an alternative that has rarely been explored, certainly in what I call a Jewish setting. Uh, I call it the cosmopolitan alternative. And all of these alternatives uh, essentially radical alternatives have emerged in the 20th century. And we're asking the basic question, what was their vision? Uh, what happened or what's happening? And if indeed uh, we are in favor of this radical experimentation, this boldness beyond tradition, then what do we need to do to make that voice heard effectively within the Jewish world, especially in this age of the return uh, to tradition. So we begin this morning with perhaps the earliest attempt. Uh, the reform movement has undergone certainly radical uh, change uh, in this century and a radical transformation. But it had a kind of original vision articulated on the North American scene by very powerful people at the beginning of this century. And the person that we have invited to talk about this is uh, somebody that I greatly admire and first encountered by reading his books. His name is Rabbi Dan Cohn Sherbach. And it's rather interesting. We have two rabbis up here on this platform both of whom were born in Denver. Raise your hand. Dan Friedman and uh, also uh, Dan Cohn Sherbach. Uh, he was born in Denver. He obviously was smart. He went to Williams College in Massachusetts. He then uh, went on to the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, where he was ordained as a reform rabbi. He then went on to serve uh, various congregations in North America, Jasper, Alabama, Galesburg, Illinois, went back to Denver. Um, so far, the story sounds ordinary. And then he chose to do something that was very different. He uh, chose to go overseas to serve reform congregations there. And he then went on to Melbourne, Australia. Uh, and Johannesburg, uh, South Africa, and then he made an even more important decision. He decided to go and pursue his PhD. And he didn't come back to the United States of America for that. He went to Cambridge, England, to Cambridge University, where he received his degree in 1975. And since then, he basically has entered into the academic world. He has taught at Essex University, Middlesex University, uh, when I first encountered him, he was teaching at the University of Kent in Essex in a very, very ancient and quaint place, quite charming, called Canterbury. Not bad, huh? And now he is a professor of Judaism uh, at the University of Wales in Lampeter in Wales. Now, he has done something that I think is quite extraordinary. I know a lot of people, and they're rabbis and they're academicians and they're people They get up in the morning and they say, you know, I'm going to write a book. And they made that decision in 1929. <laughs> and they still haven't written 
a book. Do you understand? Oh, I'm going to write my memoirs. I'm going to do <laughs> Well, now I'm going to tell you the extraordinary thing about this man. He has written over 50 books. Over 50 books. I call him the Isaac Asimov of Judaism. <laughs> I mean, like Isaac Asimov, very smart, very articulate, and can take difficult material and make it what? very, very clear and easy to read. And uh, I, I have here on this card, I, I can't remember all 50, but these, these are some of the books. I mean, on every, the Jewish heritage, Holocaust theology, issues in contemporary Judaism, Dictionary of Judaism and Christianity, Israel, the history of an idea, an atlas of Jewish history, the Jewish faith, the future of Judaism, Jewish mysticism, modern Judaism, medieval Jewish philosophy, 50 key Jewish thinkers, and on. I mean, it's an, it's an extraordinary, an extraordinary achievement. And, but the most important thing about him since I have met him and his partner in life, his wife Lavinia, who works with him on the writing of uh, some of his books. Um, he is not only intelligent, good-humored, perceptive, gracious, um, is another quality which is expressed in the latest book that he's just published, which is going to create a huge furor all over the Jewish world. It's on Messianic Jews. And the thesis of the book is indeed, because this is characteristic of him, is that we have to be open. You know, everybody says, once they get into the neighborhood, keep everybody out. Once Reformed Jews got in, they wanted to what? Keep everybody out, all right? And sometimes when humanistic Jews get in, they what? <laughs> Want to keep everybody out. Well, uh, if we're an all-inclusive Judaism, do we include all people who wish, regardless of their messianic ideology to be part of the Jewish people. It's an interesting thing. The thing I like about Dan cohn Sherbach in particular, I see him as a voice for pluralism, openness, and rationality and sanity in the Jewish world. And it's with great pleasure that I invite him to this podium. much that's a, a very kind introduction um, and a, a very undeserved introduction really it's a great pleasure to be here I've been a great fan of Rabbi Sherwin wine for many years and I've never been to a humanistic synagogue a humanistic temple I've written about humanistic temples <laughs> <laughs> so this is a pleasure and a privilege and both my wife and I would like to thank all of those who've invited me to come. Now, when Rabbi Wine asked me if I would speak about Reform Judaism, the radical vision of Reform Judaism, I thought to myself, does Reform Judaism have a radical vision, and what is it, and what am I <laughs> going to say to you? And I came to the conclusion that Reform Judaism does have a radical vision, it did have a radical vision, and to some extent does. But the point that I want to make this morning, this is an introduction to what I'm going to read to you, the point that I want to make about Reform Judaism, and this will be the theme of my paper, is that social advancement, social amelioration, escaping from the ghetto into a different world is at the heart of Reform Judaism. Of course, Reform Judaism has had an ideology, but the engine that drove that ideology was social advancement. Now, that's the point that I want to make. Now, I've been asked to provide an explanation, as I said, of the radical vision of Reform Judaism. And pondering this topic, I did ask myself whether 
Reform Judaism does or ever did have a radical vision of the Jewish faith. Certainly, growing up in the leafy suburbs of Denver, Colorado, as you've heard, I would have been hard pressed to describe my temple, Temple Emmanuel, which is a massive concrete structure in the affluent section of Denver, as radical. Bourgeois would be a more apt description. <laughs> my parents were, are, bourgeois. My parents' friends were bourgeois. The rabbi was bourgeois. Everybody was bourgeois. No one was a radical. Temple Emanuel represented mainstream, middle-class Jewish America. The emphasis was on decorum. That was really the key to the worship service, decorum. Yarmulkes were not allowed, nor were prayer shawls. The emphasis was on, well, and I, I'm satirizing the situation, the emphasis was on wearing one's best diamonds at weddings, and the biggest religious problem anyone faced was whether the weather had turned cold enough at Rosh Hashanah to justify bringing one's mink coat out of mothballs <laughs> for its first airing of the season. And I have to confess, I have to confess that my desire to be a rabbi <coughs> was also devoid of any radical motivation. To be honest, it wasn't a motivation that was based on radicalism. And over the years, I have often looked at the photographs of my bar mitzvah. On my 13th birthday, I decided what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to become a congregational rabbi. Why? I enjoyed standing in front of a congregation. I knew then at my bar mitzvah that I liked it. I, I enjoyed the adulation. I relished the praise. Being a rabbi, and I ought to look at your one, being a rabbi was a respectable way for precocious Jewish boys like me to show off. <laughs> I am glad you were amused. I could serve the Jewish people. I did want to serve the Jewish people. I could gain prominence, I hoped, in the community. And I wasn't shy about telling my family and my friends of my ambition. But I think that to myself, even to myself, I did not confess that my desire to be a rabbi was mixed with worldly ambition. But it was. And I should add, and, and this is really just a footnote and aside, you heard that I was a rabbi on four continents. I always wanted to be a congregational rabbi ever since I was a little boy. That's what I wanted to do until I did it. And, <laughs> I, was, I really was a disaster. I, I was a failure as a rabbi on four continents, which is a <laughs> And I, I did, this is an aside, I did write a book called Not a Job for a Nice Jewish Boy. And, and it's, it, it, is, it is my autobiography. Well, it's a memoir, really. And it's about why I wanted to be a rabbi and then why I found I was just a disaster. And I, I couldn't do it. I, I gave up. Well, now, to go back to the theme. I mention all this to illustrate that by the time I had made up my mind to enter the rabbinate, Reform Judaism had for the vast majority of Reform Jews lost any semblance of radicalism. Instead, it had come to symbolize Jewish respectability. That's what Temple Emmanuel stood for in Denver, Colorado. Reform Jews identified as Jews. They worshiped as Jews. But they didn't look any different from anyone else. And it was only when I attended the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati that I was told that there was a long tradition in Reform Judaism of radicalism, a long radical tradition. Israel Jacobson, Abraham Geiger, Isaac Mayer Wise, Kaufman Kohler, these figures were presented 
as radical giants of the past. They were at the Hebrew Union College presented in that way. And if you go to the college in Cincinnati, you will see that there are busts of these figures. These were the heroes, the giants of the movement, and radical figures. At least that's how they were presented to us. Despite the realities of American Jewish life in the mid 20th century, these figures, like Isaac Mayer Weiss, were presented as symbols of an enlightened, modernized, rational form of the Jewish heritage in contrast with stifling orthodoxy. But is this depiction of Reform Judaism, the depiction that I was given at HUC, a true reflection of the nature of the movement as it developed from its early origins at the beginning of the 19th century? That's the question I want to ask. Is this really a true picture? To answer this question, I want to take you back several centuries to life in the ghettos of Western and Eastern Europe. How did Jews live then? Most Jews, as you know, spoke Yiddish rather than the language of the countries where they resided. They were confined to isolated sections of cities or restricted to small Jewish villages, to shtetls. In addition, they were forced to endure a range of civil disabilities. Girls remained at home, boys went to Heder, and then, if they were able, on to yeshivot. There they studied ancient rabbinic texts like the Talmud, and in such self-confined, closed conditions, the Jewish community turned inwards, often achieving high levels of Talmudic scholarship, particularly in Eastern Europe. Century after century, Jewry lived in such restricted circumstances lacking any opportunity to assimilate into the surrounding culture. Repeatedly, Jewish communities suffered religious persecution, occasionally resulting in mass murder. But at the end of the 18th century, a fundamental change in attitude took place. During this period, a number of Christian polemicists, such as Wilhelm Christian Dohm, argued that Jews should be fully integrated into society. In an influential track, which was entitled Concerning the Amelioration of the Civil Status of the Jews, that was the name of his tract, this Christian emancipationist, Dome, stated that Jewry does not pose any threat. A wise and benevolent society, he continued, should abolish restrictions which prevent the Jewish population from having close contact with Christians and acquiring secular knowledge. All occupations, he concluded, should be open to Jews and educational opportunities should be provided. The Holy Roman Emperor, Joseph II, echoed such sentiments. And in 1781, he abolished the Jewish badge which Jews had been compelled to wear to distinguish them from the rest of the population, a very serious disability, having to wear a Jewish badge. In addition, he eliminated taxes imposed on Jewish travelers, another disability. And in the following year, he issued an Edict of Toleration, which granted Viennese Jews freedom in trade and industry and the right of residence outside Jewish quarters. Moreover, regulations prohibiting Jews from leaving their homes before noon on Sunday and attending places of public amusement were abolished. Jews were also permitted to send children to state schools or alternatively establish their own educational institutions. As in Germany, reforms in France also took place during the 1770s and the 1780s to improve the condition of the Jewish population. In 1789, for example, the French National Assembly issued a declaration proclaiming that all human beings, including Jews, all human beings are born and remain free and equal in rights and that no person should be persecuted 
for opinions as long as they do not subvert civil law, a major step forward in the emancipation of the Jews. In 1791, citizenship rights were granted to all Jews. This change in Jewish status occurred elsewhere, elsewhere in Europe as well, not just in Germany and not just in France. And this, what I've described to you about the amelioration of Jew, the Jewish condition, freeing Jews from the ghetto, this change in Jewish status serves as the background to the rise of Reform Judaism. Now that Jewry, at the end of the 18th century, had been granted the sorts of freedoms that I've described, a number of Jews sought to bring about fundamental change within the Jewish community itself. The most important figure of this period, of the late, the latter part of the 18th century, was Moses Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn was not a reformed Jew. He was the son of a Torah scribe. He had received a traditional Jewish education in Germany under the rabbi in Dessau. And in this respect, he was like other Jews of the period. He was a figure of the ghetto. Yet, unlike his co-religionist, unlike other Jews, Mendelssohn was not content with such an insular, an insular existence. He did not want to stay and live as a typical rabbinic student and rabbi, a traditional Jew. In 1743, he went to Berlin to acquire a general secular education. Remarkably, he learned Latin and Greek and English and French and Italian. And that was quite a feat for a young Talmudic student. And during this period, he met the writer and dramatist and literary critic Lessing, who was the leading advocate of enlightened toleration in Germany. That meeting between Lessing on the one hand and Mendelssohn on the other was crucial in Mendelssohn's own development. Now, prior to meeting Moses Mendelssohn, Lessing wrote a play portraying a Jew of exceptional qualities. For Lessing, as well as other Christians, Mendelssohn represented such an individual. He was the ideal Jewish type for Lessing and for others. And with Lessing's assistance, Mendelssohn published a series of philosophical essays and a major work dealing with the Jewish faith entitled Jerusalem. In 1763, he was awarded the first prize of the Prussian Royal Academy of Sciences for a philosophical study. Again, an extraordinary feat for a young Talmudic scholar. Near the end of his life, Mendelssohn became actively involved in the struggle for civil rights for the Jewish population. And the point that I want to make about Mendelssohn is that he was not a religious reformer. He was fueled by personal ambition. He sought social acceptance for himself as well as other Jews. He was determined to remain loyal to Judaism. He lived as a traditional Jew. He was an Orthodox Jew. But nonetheless, he struggled to bring about the acceptance of Jews into mainstream society. That was the aim for himself and for others. To modernize Jewish life, Mendelssohn translated the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah, into German so that Jews would be able to learn the language of the country in which they resided. Again, an extraordinary step forward. In addition, he spearheaded a commentary on scripture which combined Jewish scholarship with secular learning. Secular learning and Jewish scholarship. And following this example, a number, a number of Mendelssohn's disciples, the Moskilim, fostered a Jewish enlightenment, the Haskalah, which encouraged Jews to transcend the constrictions of ghetto life. To accomplish this end, the Moskilim, these enlightened Jews, attempted to reform Jewish education by widening the curriculum to include secular subjects. They also wrote textbooks 
and they founded Jewish schools. In addition, they also produced the first Jewish literary magazine, The Gatherer, in 1783. And those who contributed to this publication, a radical publication of its time, wrote poems and fables in the classical style of biblical Hebrew, and they contributed studies of biblical exegesis and Hebrew linguistics and Jewish study. These were Jewish revolutionaries. And for these revolutionaries, social acceptance rather than religious reform was the major aim. Like Mendelssohn, the Moskilim wanted social acceptance. The Moskilim did not seek to reconstruct Judaism along modern lines. They were not theologians or religious thinkers. Rather, they were social revolutionaries who sought to ameliorate Jewish life for themselves and for others. The Enlightenment, they believed, heralded a new stage in the development of Jewish existence. Imbued with the ideals of cultural advancement, they sought to enter into the mainstream of European society. And not surprisingly, the rabbinical establishment regarded the Moskilim as renegades who posed a serious threat to the continuation of traditional Jewish life. <coughs> These developments at the end of the 18th century served as the background for the emergence of Reform Judaism. Like Mendelssohn and the Moskilim, his followers, the early reformers also sought social acceptance. Now that is the, the theme that I want to drive home. They sought social acceptance. And they sought this through assimilation and integration into Western society. Israel Jacobson, for example, arguably the father of Reform Judaism, was a key figure of the early 19th century, the early 19th century reform movement. He was a wealthy financier, and he believed that Jewish emancipation could be obtained through the acquisition of a secular education. To this end, he founded a school for poor children in 1801 in Westphalia. And under his influence, the body tax imposed on Jews, a poll tax, was abolished in Brunswick and later elsewhere. In his view, in the view of Jacobson, the father of Reform Judaism, Napoleon was the emancipator of the Jews. And on the occasion of the assembly of, no, of Jew, Jewish notables that took place in Paris in 1806, Jacobson wrote to Napoleon and subsequently published a book in which he suggested that the emperor should organize a supreme Jewish council, which he did. Two years later, Jacobson helped organize a meeting of Jewish notables to introduce religious, moral, and civic reform among Jews. Imbued with reforming zeal, Jacobson founded a temple in 1810 at his school in which hymns were sung in German with an organ accompaniment, a major step forward in the change of Jewish liturgy, and dressed in the robes of a Christian clergyman. So we have to imagine the father of Reform Judaism, the early part of the 19th century, dressed in the robes of a Protestant clergyman, he conducted the festivities at his school. And he gave an address at that dedication ceremony in which he declared, and I quote, our ritual, the traditional ritual, is still weighed down with religious customs and must be rightly offensive to reason as well as to our Christian friends. It desecrates the holiness of our religion and it dishonors the reasonable man to place too great a value upon such customs. On the other hand, he is greatly honored if he can encourage himself and his friends to realize their dispensability. Due to such activities, Israel Jacobson has been herald, heralded as the first reformed Jew. He reformed the liturgy. It is clear that his main objective was the emancipation and amelioration of the Jewish community. And the way to achieve that end was by changing the liturgy. More decorum, more order. 
the elimination of what he regarded as repugnant and disagreeable. The aim of creating a school where pupils studied Jewish as well as secular subjects was to facilitate the entry of Jews into mainstream society. The alterations of the Jewish religious service and the creation of a temple were key elements in this program of change. For Jacobson's view, in Jacobson's view, traditional Jewish services lack the grandeur and decorum of Christian worship. It just wasn't good enough. Jacobson's aim was to revolutionize the mode of worship in imitation of Christian practices. And that <coughs> was in Reform Judaism throughout the 19th and into the 20th century. The next stage in Jacobson's campaign took place in Berlin after the fall of Napoleon. On the occasion of his son's bar mitzvah in 1815, Jacobson opened a reform synagogue in his house. He established a synagogue in his house, which was later transformed to the home of a banker. In 1817, a reform temple was opened in Hamburg, in which a number of innovations were made to the liturgy, including prayers and sermons in German, as well as choral singing and organ music. Such changes were made largely for aesthetic reasons. These early reformers were embarrassed by practices which they perceived as lacking dignity. They wanted to dignify the service. They were embarrassed, embarrassed by the, the scene of Jews rocking, praying. They wanted to change all that. They did not advocate the reconstruction of Jewish belief and practice, not then. Rather, their aims were limited to liturgical reform. To defend such alterations, the Hamburg reformers cited the Talmud in support of their actions. They wanted to show what, the, that what they were doing was legitimate in terms of the tradition. In 1819, the community issued its own prayer book, which omitted repetitions of prayers as well as medieval poems. In addition, some of the prayers related to Jewish nationalism and messianic redemption were changed. But note, all this was liturgical. Israel Jacobson, to whom this prayer book was dedicated, was instrumental in obtaining a number of rabbinic opinions in support of the temple. For Jacobson and the early reformers, it was vital that their activities were justified on traditional grounds. The Hungarian rabbi, Aaron Horan, for example, declared that it was not only permissible, but obligatory to free the liturgy from its adhesions, to hold the service in a language understandable to a worshiper, and to accompany it with organ and song. Not surprisingly, such liturgical innovations provided the Orthodox establishment, it, it provoked the Orthodox establishment to issue a proclamation condemning the Hamburg reformers. One of the figures of the Beit Din of Prague, for example, stated, about these reforms, and I quote, these people really have no religion at all. That's what he was saying about the Hamburg reformers and about Israel Jacobson. It is their entire desire to parade before the Christians as being more learned than their brothers, namely us. Basically, they are neither Christians nor Jews. The central aim of these early reformers was thus to adapt Jewish worship to contemporary standards. For these innovators, the informality of the traditional service seemed foreign and undignified, and they therefore insisted on greater decorum, just like in Temple Emmanuel in Denver, Colorado, more unison in prayer, a choir, just like in Temple Emmanuel, hymns and musical responses, as well as alterations in prayers and the length of the service. At this stage in the development of Reform Judaism, there was no vision other than improving the character of worship in imitation of Christian services. So if you ask, what was, the, what was the radical vision of the early reformers? The radical vision was to change the worship service, to make it more aesthetic, to make it more pleasing, to make it more like a Christian service so that they wouldn't be embarrassed. Yet for some Jews, influenced by the Romantic movement, 
even these modifications were insufficient. Two of Moses Mendelssohn's daughters, for example, became Christian converts, as did other women whose literary salons in Berlin were attended by leading German intellectuals. For these women, women like Mendelssohn's daughters, social acceptance into Christian society was of fundamental importance, and in their view, it could only be obtained through conversion, not through liturgical change, not through the movement of Jews into Western society by adhering to their religion. The quest for social recognition, which motivated the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, as well as early liturgical reform, also served as the background to a new intellectual development within post-Enlightenment society. The creation of a society for the culture and academic study of Judaism. This was a new body created during this period, a society for the culture and academic study of Judaism. This discipline encouraged the systematic study of history and a respect for historical fact. The purpose of this new approach, in theory, was to gain a true understanding of the origins of the Jewish tradition in the history of Western civilization. But my point is, even that society was created for the purpose of generating social change, of allowing Jews to enter into the mainstream of Western society and civilization. In 1824, however, this society collapsed. It disappeared. And several of its members, such as the poet Heine and the historian of law, Edward Gans, converted to Christianity to advance their careers. So that society wasn't good enough. The reaction of the Orthodox to these early reformers highlights their true intentions. Samson Raphael Hirsch, for example, a major figure of the Orthodox movement in the 19th century, wrote a very important work entitled The 19 Letters on Judaism, which was a defense of orthodoxy in the form of essays by a young Jew, a young rabbi, to a friend who questioned the importance of remaining a Jew. And this work by Hirsch commenced with a typical critique of Judaism of this period, the kind of critique that reformers were making. And, and this is the sort of critique. While the best of mankind climbed to the summit of culture, prosperity, and wealth, that was what was going on in Europe, the Jewish people remain poor in everything that makes human beings great and noble and that beautifies and dignifies our lives. That's the kind of criticism one could make of traditional Judaism. And in response to that kind of criticism, Hirsch replied that the purpose of human life is not to attain personal happiness and perfection, but rather humans should strive to serve God by obeying his will. That's the purpose of life, not to attain happiness, but to serve God. And in this light, Reformed Judaism was castigated for abandoning the sacred duty of serving God. For Hirsch, citizenship rights are of minor importance, though the reformers thought they were of major importance, since Jewry is united by a bond of obedience to God's laws. No change in the tradition, he believed, could be justified, even if it resulted in better living conditions for the Jewish population. Despite Hirsch's criticisms of reforming tendencies, however, a number of German rabbis who had been influenced by the Enlightenment began to reevaluate the Jewish tradition. They wanted to go beyond liturgical reform. In their view, Jews should emerge from the ghetto into the mainstream of modern life. And in this undertaking, the achievement of Jewish scholars such as Leopold Zuntz, who engaged in the scientific study of Judaism, had a profound impact. In 1842, the Society of the Friends of Reform was founded in Frankfurt and published a proclamation justifying their innovative approach to tradition. In the declaration of their principles, the Society declared that they recognized the possibility of unlimited progress in the Jewish faith 
and rejected the authority of the legal code as well as the belief in messianic redemption. These are theological changes, not just liturgical changes. Furthermore, the members of the society considered circumcision a barbaric rite, which should be eliminated from Judaism, they believed. A similar group, the Association for the Reform of Judaism, was founded in Berlin in 1844 under the leadership of Samuel Holdheim and called for major changes in the Jewish tradition. The association produced a prayer book in German which contained very little Hebrew and abolished such customs as praying with covered heads and blowing the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. In their proclamation, the Berlin group declared, and I quote, we can no longer recognize a code as, unchangeable, as an unchangeable law book which maintains with unbending insistence that Judaism's task is expressed by forms which originated in a time which is forever past and which will never return. We are stirred by the trumpet sound, no, not the sound of the shofar, by the trumpet sound of our own time. It calls us to be the last of a great inheritance in this old form, and at the same time, the first who, with unswerving courage, are bound together as brothers in word and deed, shall lay the, counterstone, the cornerstone of a new edifice. They wanted to create a new edifice. They wanted to reform the religion, not just change the liturgy. Now, these are noble sentiments. They are stirring words. But again, at bottom, these early reformers of the tradition were motivated, I believe, by social aspiration. They were embarrassed by their co-religionists, by their orthodox co-religionists who continued to live a ghetto-like existence. These reformers were anxious to distance themselves from what they regarded as a primitive lifestyle. They were the vanguard of social mobility. And in their view, Judaism needed to be modernized so that Jews could obtain social and civil acceptance. It was a means to an end, change the religion, and thereby gain and win social acceptance. A critical scientific understanding of the development of Judaism provided the basis for change. How do you change the tradition? By understanding it critically and scientifically, and then you can change it, and then you can be like everyone else. Outmoded beliefs and behavior could be replaced by an informed and enlightened approach to the faith. <coughs> wanted was an informed and enlightened approach to Judaism, but this was fueled by the quest for social acceptance. The new edifice envisaged by the Berlin reformers was nothing less than a reconstructed Judaism, devoid of ignorance and superstition. They didn't want ignorance. They didn't want superstition. They did not want the ghetto. They had a vision of a new kind of Judaism for a new man and a new woman, free and equal. In the United States, Reform Judaism had been instituted with similar aims. As early as 1815, a congregation was established in Charleston, South Carolina, which attempted to introduce some of the reforms of Germany's Hamburg temple into the synagogue worship. According to one of these early reformers, the desire of the Charleston Reform community was, quote, to take away everything that might excite disgust of the well-informed Israelite. No, not Jew, but Israelite. During this period, Isaac Mayer Weiss, who had well, the hero of the Hebrew Union College, our hero, Sherwin Wine's hero, my hero, well, at least that's what we, he was supposed to be our hero, Isaac Mayer Weiss, who had, emigrated, who had emigrated to the New World from Bohemia, exercised his leadership and reforming skills. He was a great leader and a great administrator. In Cincinnati, Ohio, he founded the Conference of American Reform Rabbis. Uh, 
And this was followed in 1873 by the establishment of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations and eventually the creation of the Hebrew Union College. The U no, the Hebrew Union College, I should go back, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, not the Jewish Union, and the Hebrew Union College, not Jews Union College or Jews College. Note the use of the term Hebrew rather than Jewish. It is of significance. Wise and other reformers of this period were anxious to identify themselves as Hebrews rather than Jews. The term Jew was invidious. It was identified with the ghettos of Eastern Europe. Being a Hebrew, however, had different connotations then. It designated an individual who subscribed to Judaism as a religion. And by altering such terminology, the early reformers hoped to eschew the negative stereotypes of the past. That's what they wanted to escape from, the negative stereotypes of the past evoked by the term Jew. Reform Judaism then offered the Jewish people an escape route from ghetto life. Orthodoxy was identified with poverty and ignorance. It was associated with the anti-Jewish attitudes of previous centuries. In the modern world, what was required was a new vision of Judaism in harmony with contemporary values. If Jews were to become full citizens, they had to refashion the Jewish faith, not just change the liturgy, but refashion the faith. And to this end, the reformers who met in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1889 to formulate the principles of the movement, the Pittsburgh Platform issued a statement of belief which redefined Judaism. And the Pittsburgh Platform in the history of Reform Judaism is pivotal. It is a landmark document. This declaration appears at face value, and I think was, to be motivated ideologically. It appears to be ideologically motivated, as though the framers of the Pittsburgh platform were driven by the, an idealistic vision of the Jewish faith. And no doubt, when they formulated the Pittsburgh platform, they were convinced of the need for radical change. Yet, in line with the evolution of Reform Judaism in Europe and the United States, these reformers sought to integrate Judaism into contemporary culture and thereby escape the disabilities faced by Jews in previous centuries. They too, at the end of the 19th century, were like the early reformers at the beginning of the 19th century and like Israel Jacobs. It should be remembered that at this time, at the end of the 19th century, when the Pittsburgh platform was formulated, Zionist thinkers advocated an entirely different approach, entirely different from Reform Judaism. You have Reform Judaism on the one hand and Zionist thinkers on the other. In the view of the Zionists, Jews could never be assimilated into the cultures in which they lived. They denied what the Reformers affirmed. Hence, the only solution to the Jewish problem, according to Zionists, was the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. In the middle of the 19th century, for example, an early Zionist thinker, Moses Hess, published a work, an important work entitled Rome and Jerusalem, a defense of Jewish nationalism. And in his opinion, according to Hess, anti-Judaism, anti-Jewish sentiment is simply unavoidable. It cannot be escaped. It cannot be escaped through reform. No reform of the religion, he argued, is radical enough to avoid anti-Jewish hostility. And even conversion to Christianity cannot relie relieve the Jew of this disability. That was the view of this Zionist. He wrote in Roman Jerusalem, Jewish noses cannot be reformed and the black wavy hair of the Jews will not be changed into blonde by conversion or straightened out by combing. Of course, this was before <laughs> plastic surgery and... 
uh, means by which curly hair could be changed. But you see his point. No change was really possible. You couldn't change Jewish disabilities by reforming the faith. In a similar vein, Theodore Herzl argued that Jews are destined to remain victims if they are in the minority, a view totally at odds with the view of the early reformers and the later reformers. He said in the Jewish state, Herzl said, we, and I quote, we have sincerely tried everywhere to merge with the national communities in which we live, seeking only to preserve the faith of our fathers. It is not permitted us. In vain are we loyal patriots, sometimes super loyal. In vain do we make the same sacrifices of life and property as our fellow citizens. In vain do we strive to enhance the fame of our native lands in the arts and sciences or her wealth by trade and commerce. It is all in vain. The only solution to the Jewish problem, to the problem of anti-Semitism, is for Jews to have a land of their own where they are in the majority, where they are in the majority. So this was the sentiment of Zionists at the time the Pittsburgh platform was being proposed. At the Pittsburgh conference, however, reform leaders repudiated <coughs> such Zionist sentiments. They repudiated this anti-assimilationist ideology. Rejecting the Zionist solution, they contended that Judaism must be changed so that Jews will be able to integrate easily into contemporary society. Hence, the Pittsburgh platform proclaimed, and I quote, we consider ourselves no longer a nation, but a religious community. As such, we expect neither a return to Palestine nor a sacrificial worship under the administration of the sons of Aaron, nor the restoration of any of the laws concerning the Jewish state. That's what they said in the Pittsburgh platform. Judaism was to metamorphose into a religion like Christianity. Therefore, the Pittsburgh platform categorically rejected those laws which no longer served to enlighten the Jewish people. The Pittsburgh platform states, Today we accept as binding only the moral laws and maintain only such ceremonies as alleviate and sanctify, as, sorry, as elevate and sanctify our lives, but reject all such as are not adapted to the views and habits of modern civilization. And in this light, anachronistic regulations were to be rejected. The platform goes on to state, we hold that all such mosaic and rabbinic laws as regulate diet priestly purity and dress originated in ages and under the influence of ideas altogether foreign to our present mental and spiritual state. They fail to impress the modern Jew with the spirit of priestly holiness. Their observance in our days is apt rather to obstruct than to further modern spiritual elevation. In other words, specifically ethnic observances which distinguish Jews from non-Jews were to be eliminated. Progressive Jews, <coughs> Reformed Jews, were to be indistinguishable from their non-Jewish neighbors. Judaism was to be transformed into a rational religion, subject to the dictates of reason. Thus, the Reformers stated, we hold that the modern discoveries of scientific researches in the domain of nature and history are not antagonistic to the doctrines of Judaism. The Bible reflecting the primitive ideas, primitive ideas of its own age, and at times clothing its conception of divine providence and justice, dealing with men in miraculous narratives. Judaism thus conceived presents, according to the platform, the highest conception of the God idea as taught in our holy scriptures and developed and spiritualized by the Jewish teachers in accordance with the moral and philosophical progress of their respective ages. While accepting the spiritual integrity of other scriptural texts and other religions, the reformers went on to affirm the uniqueness of the Hebrew Bible in the life of the nation. Nonetheless, this did not mean that Jews were to remain isolated as they had been in previous centuries. Rather, they were to join together with members of other faiths, particularly Christianity and Islam, 
in proclaiming the truth of monotheism. Further, in accordance with the spirit of Mosaic legislation, the Jewish community, they said, has a responsibility to ameliorate the situation of the poor and oppressed in contemporary society. Finally, the Pittsburgh reformers were anxious to disassociate Judaism from misguided eschatological beliefs of previous centuries, which they regarded as out of date and incorrect. And so they said in the Pittsburgh platform, we reassert the doctrine of Judaism that the soul of men is immortal, grounding this belief on the divine nature of the human spirit, which forever finds bliss in righteousness and misery in wickedness, we reject as ideas rooted in Judaism the belief both in bodily resurrection in Gehenna and Eden, that is, hell and paradise, as abodes for everlasting punishment or reward. They rejected all that. The Pittsburgh platform then was a watershed in the radical vision of the reform movement. Distancing itself from traditional Judaism, those who assembled in Pittsburgh sought to articulate the central principles of a modernized faith in accord with the latest developments in contemporary thought. The reform of Judaism was thus a product of the Haskalah, of the Enlightenment. By reforming the faith, the leaders of this new movement Reform Judaism, sought to ensure that Jews would be freed of the disabilities of the past. This messianic vision, it was to them a messianic vision without a messiah, entailed the reconstruction of the Jewish faith into a spiritualized religion like Christianity, devoid of ethnic peculiarities. Jews were to step out of the ghetto into the light of the contemporary age as new Jews, new men and women, equipped to face the challenge of modernity. It can be seen then that, the ref that Reform Judaism offered an idealistic ver vision of the Jewish future in which biblical and rabbinic traditions would be radically transformed. No longer would Jews live isolated lives under the rigorous legal constrictions of the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law. They would not look different from their non-Jewish neighbors. They would look just like them. They would be able to speak with them, eat with them, work with them, and socialize with them, and inevitably marry them. This revolution could occur naturally, but only if the Jewish people were prepared to discard anachronistic folkways. Reform Judaism offered them a means of remaining religiously Jewish while at the same time freeing them of the restrictions of the past. Rejecting the gloomy prognosis of Zionism, reformers were convinced that cultural and social assimilation and integration could be assured, attained and assured. The reform revolution was thus driven by the quest for social integration and acceptance. Framed in religious terms, it sought to provide a means of overcoming misunderstanding, prejudice, and hostility. And like Zionism, it was conceived as a solution to the problem of anti-Semitism. So let me return then, after this historical journey, to the central question I posed at the beginning of this lecture. Did Reform Judaism have a radical vision of the nature of the faith? Did Reform Judaism have a radical vision? There is no doubt that the early reformers, their proposals to alter the liturgy and worship service constituted a departure. It was a departure from the tradition. And as we have seen, the reformers were bitterly attacked by the orthodox establishment for such liturgical deviations. And as time passed, reform leaders became even bolder about the steps that should be taken to regenerate the Jewish heritage. The Pittsburgh platform in particular signaled a major departure from both the beliefs and practices of the past. Yet underlying these changes, which I've outlined to you this morning, was the central aspiration, 
It was the central aspiration inherited from the Haskala to assimilate into Jewish life, to assimilate Judaism into modern life. Like the Moskilim of the 19th century, reformed Jews sought to escape the ghetto life of previous centuries. Both the rabbis and the lay leadership of the movement consciously wished to distance themselves from their ancestors. Modern life offered Jews numerous social, educational, civic, and financial advantages. Reform Judaism offered these individuals a means of embracing these opportunities while remaining, at least in their own eyes, faithful to the tradition. They could embrace all the opportunities of modern life and remain, in their own eyes, faithful to the Jewish heritage. The implicit ideology of Reform Judaism as it evolved from its origins in the Haskalah to the present day has thus been the quest for social acceptance and advancement. Make no mistake, Reform Judaism has from its inception had a radical vision of a Jewish future. It was not based on philosophical or theological premises, nor was it shaped by research into the development of Judaism as a civilization. Rather, Reform Judaism as a movement emerged as a response to the challenges and opportunities posed by the Enlightenment. Under the impact of both Christian and Jewish writers, the ghetto walls had been shattered, shattered forever. In the wake of this cataclysmic development, Reform Jews sought to reconstruct Judaism out of the shattered remains of the past, the shattered remains of the ghetto past, so as to facilitate assimilation and social integration. At long last, after centuries of anti-Jewish hostility, Jews were able to divest themselves of their ancient folkways and become modern citizens of the countries where they lived, like the United States. For reform Jews, this was the fulfillment of messianic longing which had sustained the Jewish people through centuries of suffering and despair. A radical vision, a new Judaism for a modern Jew. 